Hi, I'm Tim Clark, and this is Conversations About the Vietnam War. My special guest today is Curtis Thompson. Uh, Curtis was a graduate of the Ballard class of 1966, uh, and uh, he was attached to the 44th Medical Brigade of the 25th Infantry of the U.S. Army. And as we go through Curtis's story, uh, I would ask the audience to basically keep in mind a good lesson about in a combat zone, you have to be adaptable. That, that simply is a part of making the whole operation work. So you actually came out of high school and uh, went into a Boeing training program, is that correct? Uh, I trained while in high school as a machinist and uh, not too long after I had graduated and was working in independent, I did work for Boeing uh, Airplane Company and I was in quality control on the brand new aircraft called the 737. So you were working right out of Renton, uh, down by the lake? Uh, it was actually at the south end of Seattle, uh, across from the flight line on Boeing Field. Oh, okay. Uh, so you're, you, you, you basically are working, um, trying to build a, a new life, and all of a sudden you get a draft notice. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, I had a house that I was renting. Uh, I was fully independent with a full-time job working uh, along with other people that were 10, 20, 30 years older than I was, uh, and I had been uh, emancipated, as they say, uh, on my own for a couple of years. Uh, not old enough to vote, not old enough to drink, but old enough to be drafted. So uh, you're taken in uh, basically in February, is that correct? Right. And where did where'd you go for basic? Uh, my basic training was at what was then called Fort Lewis, uh, North Fort Lewis, where there were many, many uh, draftees and enlistees uh, going through basic training. And then as you finish basic, you're then assigned to some sort of advanced school. What would you end up in? Uh, my assignment after basic training was advanced training initially in gas and diesel engines at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. And my performance was well top of the class so that I advanced on to uh, generator operation and maintenance school. And again, I hit top of the class. So in both cases, I was promoted to specialist uh, pay grade E4. Uh, all of that basic training and advanced training took, and promotions took place within five months. So you're going along and you're being certified basically to run generators. Uh, there are some unusual things that can happen to people as they get more skilled. Um, what are sorts of things that generators can be used for in combat situations? Well, we were taught in the latter part of our generator school that uh, there was a 400 cycle version of the electricity rather than the typical household 60 cycle that would be used either for radar or for cryptology, crypto as it was simply announced. And in fact, when we graduated, a couple of our classes were uh, placed on hold. That is, we did not receive any orders for our duty assignment uh, because the Army Security Agency wanted to uh, do background checks and security checks so that there would be some of us who would be assigned to a, a crypto uh, assignment somewhere in the world. And some of those assignments were civilian clothes only. So it, it turned out though that you didn't get one of those assignments. So what happened? So uh, while waiting for that security clearance, which took a few months, I worked as training cadre for a unit that required everyone leaving Fort Belvoir for Southeast Asia, Vietnam, uh, to go through a week's worth of training. And at the uh, end of the period when the security agency, Army Security Agency, had decided they had the right number of people, I uh, received my orders to go to Vietnam. All right. Uh, now, you also had a brother serving in the military. What was he doing? Uh, my one year younger brother uh, was already in Vietnam at the time I was training uh, back east. Uh, he was with the 101st Airborne. My older brother uh, was also uh, had been drafted and he was serving as a uh, military policeman in Presidio uh, near San Francisco. 
All right, so you've gotten your orders to go to Vietnam. You get a chance to go back home, is that correct? Right, I, I did get a leave period for one month uh, between my advanced training uh, and my assignment to Vietnam. Okay, so in about December 14th, uh, you got your orders to go, and where do you report? Um, get on the plane and fly down to Oakland, California, to a warehouse, large warehouse facility, uh, where we're simply told where to be and when to be, uh, and uh, we shed our clothing and personal objects. We're given jungle fatigues, and um, in a matter of somewhere around 12 to 18 hours, we're eventually put on a bus and taken out to the flight line and, and uh, get on our plane and headed for Vietnam. All right, so you now have been assigned to the 25th Infantry, is that correct? Uh, when I arrive in Vietnam, I'm actually assigned to a medical brigade that, that serves a number of units, including the 25th Infantry Division. And where, where, is, where are they located? Well, the 44th Medical Brigade is headquartered in a place called Benoit, and the specific unit uh, of that is the 40th Medical Detachment, a dental unit uh, at the headquarters of Kuchi, uh, 25th Infantry Division, Kuchi Headquarters. All right, so uh, when you uh, arrive there, uh, you're designated as the power man, is that correct? Right. My, my primary assignment at that dental unit is to provide electricity, to operate and maintain the generators, and my secondary duties are to do everything not dental, such as uh, run the motor pool, uh, build new structures for sleeping. Uh, at one time I built sidewalks uh, of concrete to replace the wooden uh, platforms. and. Um, so I did that for a few months until I uh, had some serious problems with my skin reaction. And later, long time later, I learned that it was really chemical exposure from highly toxic dirt that I sometimes was uh, lying in underneath vehicles doing maintenance, uh, oil changes, and grease jobs. All right, so uh, you're now, at, now Kuchi is the uh, uh, 25th Division Headquarters, is that correct? Yes, 25th yeah. Infantry Division Headquarters at that time with a couple of small airstrips. It was, it was a small city, uh, self-contained in every way. Okay, all right, so you're not going to be able to continue doing what you're doing. What does the Army do with you? Well, the unit had a choice of giving me back, basically, for a reassignment, but they chose to train me. Uh, so I was trained as a dental assistant, uh, no longer doing uh, work that involved chemicals, uh, fuels, diesel, and solvents. And uh, so I trained as a dental assistant. Uh, I also was trained in doing x-rays, so that just like today when you go into the dentist and you need x-rays, then I was the x-ray technician. And several weeks later, uh, when the oral hygienist was due to finish his tour and go home, uh, I was nominated to be trained, and I did retrain as an oral hygienist. So, uh, what specific uh, uh, things does an oral hygienist do? Because it's okay. Oral hygienist, just like today, a little less fancy with a little less. Uh, of the plastic and gloves and masks, uh, but basically my job was to examine and, and clean people's teeth. Um, when working in the clinic with dentists, I didn't do what you would call a, an, an exam. Um, that was left to the dentist, uh, but I had uh, the various instruments almost identical to what are used today. All right, now your company commander basically made a decision that he felt uh, had to do with uh, uh, well, let's, let's talk just for a brief moment about the, the time period when you entered the war. So you entered the war in basically 1968, is that correct? Yes, uh, I entered the Army in 1968 and uh, fundamentally two weeks remaining in 1968 I was in Vietnam in combat zone. All right, so the war has really picked up its pace in terms of its demands of what the military is trying to do? 
um, when I arrived in Vietnam was about the time the maximum number of uh, American soldiers and airmen were in Vietnam. It was very, very close to half a million at, on a given day. Okay. So, uh, all right, uh, so the, the company commander makes a decision in terms of wanting to change how people are serviced in the field. What was that all about? Um, I actually learned years and years later that the most effective single medical procedure or, or appointment, if you will, uh, that would keep people on the job and keep them from having to be taken in from the field was a trip to the dentist and our company commander, our colonel, um, put together a modified trailer with two dental chairs, a 300 gallon water tank and its own generator in order to bring dental care to the field uh, to further minimize the downtime if someone needed to make a trip to the dentist from way out in the field, it could take several days turnaround time to get them in, get them to the dentist and get them back out. But by taking dentistry to the field, it was a matter of people simply standing in line, uh, first come, first serve, and we could avoid the toothaches and other things that would happen if they didn't receive their dental treatment. So you're actually going to go out to the fire bases? Yes. All right. Uh, and if I can, uh, Kuchi is in uh, a, a division command headquarter. How many fire bases uh, are they basically serving in uh, Tainan province? Um, I never really knew exactly how many there were. Over the period of seven months that I was in the field, uh, I visited probably 20 different fire bases, and I know there were, <coughs> excuse me, I know there were more fire bases than than I had visited. But so there were probably there were at least 30 and perhaps 40. Right, and uh, roughly how big are these? His fire bases were roughly the size of, say, two football fields, but rather than being rectangular, they were, all of the fire bases I was at were round. Uh, the outer perimeter was a pile of dirt about four feet high and several feet wide, and that was where there were people positioned on guard duty day and night, and there would be a carefully guarded entrance and barbed wire and Outside of that berm line would be uh, many, many claymore mines, uh, all with wires back to the guard posts uh, to prevent uh, our being overrun. All right, the converted command trailer that has now become the field dentist office, how do you get that from firebase to firebase? Uh, when people no longer stood in line at a firebase, uh, we would radio back in and transportation people would send out a truck, uh, a tractor combination like you see on the roads today that would uh, simply come out, hook up to the trailer, and either by convoy or occasionally we would go solo, but most of the time we would join a convoy of vehicles that would take us to the next fire base. And uh, weather obviously impacts travel. What's, uh, what are the seasons and what's the difference? Well, in that part of Vietnam, uh, essentially there's two seasons, dust and mud. So uh, in the muddy season, nearly six months of it, transportation on the road is very slow and yucky. Uh, the mud cakes on your boots, it cakes on the wheels and all of the equipment. Uh, and it actually slows the war down considerably uh, for both sides. Uh, all right, so let's go uh, inside a day when you have now arrived at a new fire base. Uh, what's the work day going to be like? Well, the work day is uh, slightly after dawn. Uh, we would be able to get up and get something to eat. Sometimes that would be eating army food at the time in the field was sea rations. Uh, some of the fire bases would have a tent for a mess hall where we could get some breakfast. Uh, generally, there was only one mess hall meal a day. The other two meals were tin can meals. An hour or so after daybreak with nothing better to do, uh, we would clean up the uh, trailer and fire up the generator and we would start seeing patients, uh, you know, first come, first serve. And we would take a little bit of a break at lunchtime and go back uh, to work until 
maybe five o'clock in the evening, uh, a little while before sunset, uh, and we'd shut down the van. Uh, again, do a little bit of cleanup, and then if they were available, we would have a hot meal from the mess tent. And uh, at sunset, all lights out, uh, complete blackout for obvious reasons. We didn't want to be a target in the middle of the night. Uh, get some sleep, and the next day would be much the same. Now, sometimes you actually got drafted into other duties on bases. Well, uh, in the dental clinic, we wore uh, scrubs or a smock for an upper shirt. We didn't go into full scrubs like you would see in the hospital or some dental offices today. But uh, invariably, people would make the assumption that if we knew how, knew how to do any kind of a medical procedure, that we were a valuable asset in the medic's bunker. And so um, just just sort of naturally and automatically, uh, I was always told where the medic's bunker was and that I was welcome to, uh, to spend my nights there. All right, and so if the base gets ambushed and you start to get incoming mortar fire, you're on duty. As fast as I could get there, I would be in the medic's bunker uh, ready to help out. And uh, there were times, indeed, that, uh, that I did treat uh, soldiers who were wounded. All right. Um, uh, by the way, you also mentioned in a previous conversation about uh, you even dealt with uh, Vietnamese. Uh, when I was back at the Coochie Clinic and going through my various stages of training, uh, one of the things I did was assist in oral surgery. Uh, we didn't do fillings or complicated dental work for the Vietnamese, but we had a program of trying to win the hearts of Vietnamese. And one of the things we could do that was very helpful would be to remove teeth that truly were not salvageable and uh, prevent the risk of, of serious infection and other things that will happen if you don't remove a basically very rotten tooth. So we did oral surgery and I did some of the oral surgery, learned how to anesthetize and uh, properly pull teeth. All right, uh, by the way, uh, you mentioned on your tours, it's 30 days and every time you go out, it's a new dentist with you. The um, commanding officer requested dentists, dental assistants and myself to uh, do 30 days in the field. And uh, that accomplished a couple of things. It made it easier for people to volunteer because we were not normally a unit assigned to work in the field. Uh, and it qualified people to earn a combat medic badge. So every 30 days, uh, a draftee dentist uh, and typically uh, uh, an enlisted uh, individual who chose to join the Army as his assistant uh, would come out, but I continued to stay in the field for seven of those 30-day trials because um, that was the most, and uh, hard to say, enjoyable. It was the most rewarding thing that I could do. It was, for me, much better than working back at the much larger division base camp. And by the way, what was the reaction of the troops when you're out there uh, working with them? When our dental trailer was towed into a fire base, it was essentially a jaw-dropping experience. If they'd have had a red carpet, they would have rolled it out. I would be approached by the first sergeant uh, or someone and asked, what do you need, what do you want? I'd be handed a case of sea rations for my choice of food, which may not sound very enticing, but really to have a choice of, of what we were going to eat out of a can was was really worth something. Uh, and we were given the extraordinary privilege of being allowed to use the commanding officer's shower stall, which was basically an open air structure, barely a framework that you could tilt a gallon, a five gallon can of water on yourself scrub down and tilt the rest of the water to rinse off, uh, whereas the, the rest of the troops uh, showered occasionally in, in some sort of a large circular shower 
10, 12 people at a time. So, so we were treated like VIPs. Uh, and not that there was a lot of privilege to, to be found out there, but what there was, we were granted. Uh, it, was, it was just impressive. And that's why I'm saying that for me, there was no better way for me to spend my last seven months in Vietnam than, than providing uh, dental care that was appreciated to that degree. Now, you did actually get some breaks from the duty in the field, is that correct? Yes, I had saved up. We were allowed uh, one week's of rest and recuperation, R&R, &R, and in my last three months, uh, I had an R&R &R, uh, trip to Australia, to Sydney, and I had a one week leave uh, that I was allowed, and I spent that in Hong Kong. Other than that, uh, all of those seven months I, I was in the field. Now, by the way, it, uh, about how many procedures do you think you actually uh, carried out while dealing with the dentist? Uh? Sure, we, we, we frequently, I uh, was able to do, because of the long hours uh, and generally good health of, of the soldiers that I worked on, I could do 12 to 18 um, hygiene treatments a day and spread out since we didn't really take weekends off uh, or anything like that, I roughly calculated that somewhere around 2,500, maybe as many as 3,000 procedures uh, over that seven months. Oh, that's a lot. Um, all right, so your tour duty, basically, you spent 12, uh, 12 months. Uh, it's now December 1969. What's going to happen? As I finished my tour time and was ready to go home, or DROS as it was called, um, I came back into the Kuchi headquarters of a 40th medical uh, detachment uh, to pack up what few things I had and go through paperwork for going home. I wasn't expecting it, but there was a company formation that was called and I was um, pinned, uh, given an award called an Army Accommodation Medal for extra work or better than usual, perhaps simply for volunteering so many times to be out in the field. And I was also given the paperwork and for my combat medics badge. And um, then when the day came, we got in a Jeep and drove the 40 miles or so down to uh, Benoit. To, to get on a plane and fly home. Actually, if we can do one more comment about duty in the field. You mm -hmm. mentioned that it's never really quiet. What does that really mean? Well, e e everywhere in Vietnam that I was, including division base camp, and even out in the field where we were tw 10, 20, 30 miles away from the major base camps, uh, day and night, 24 hours, there was never more than a few minutes quiet. It was either helicopters that you could hear flying one way or another, or an artillery uh, fire mission, whether it was at the fire base that we were at, or one near enough by that we could still hear it. Um, in fact, when I was there the first few months, there were times we could feel the ground shake from the B-52 bombing runs. So uh, there was enough noise in and surprised me that we, I learned how to sleep through the outgoing artillery, or we would just say outgoing, uh, to the point that I might get up in the morning and wonder why the artillery crews were dragging around and they'd say, yeah, well, we had fire mission for two and a half hours in the middle of the night. And yet, whenever there was an incoming round, a mortar round or a rocket or anything, um, it would be as though I hadn't been asleep. I would know exactly what direction it had came from and at what distance, and I would be instantly wide awake. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange set of things that happen to a person when you're under constant stress or threat of stress for an extended period of time. It's, uh, it, it's, it's quite a transition that takes place. And it's a skill that keeps you alive? Uh, I guess you'd have to call that survival skill, yes. Yeah. All right, uh, you're finally uh, on your way back. You come back to Oakland, is that correct? Yes, when I flew back, uh, my out-processing center was Oakland. Uh, 
that was just a constant set of movement from leaving my unit at Koo Chi in Vietnam, the jeep ride down, getting on the airplane, uh, flying, refueling in Japan, and then all the way back to Oakland where we offloaded and a bus took us to another large warehouse where we shed our uniforms and uh, went through some minor medical reviews and out processing with paperwork. At the end of that, uh, and I didn't know it was the end, but I got to the end of the desk and uh, a sergeant handed me an airplane ticket and told me that if I would step out the door right there at the side of this warehouse, there would be a taxi to take me to the airport. And indeed, I stepped out the door and there was a taxi. Uh, I got in the taxi and he already knew where he was taking me, he took me to the airport and got on in the plane and flew home to Seattle. All right, so now you have to make that adjustment back to civilian life. Uh, what are you gonna do for a job? What are you gonna do? I was rehired as the law required at Boeing upon returning. Uh, however, the economy was in a serious downturn and within 30 days I was laid off. And so I learned about unemployment, which was available, and over the next few months I went into doing a little bit of planning and research and decided that I would take advantage of the GI Bill and that fall I enrolled at Green River Community College. And what were you going to study? I didn't have a real clear study plan. Uh, I was contemplating doing my studies in preparation for dental school, but the, the strategy that I employed was to take as much of the challenging science and math courses as I could, um, somewhat minimizing the humanities, but I did have to take a balanced coursework, of course. So I did some history and English and some other things. So what kind of a degree did you end up with? Well, I was so naive, I didn't know that I couldn't just continue to go to school or the community college beyond two years. Uh, uh, apparently, I did have an AA degree. I didn't really ask for it. I never got a piece of paperwork. But I did learn from my fellow students that I needed to transfer. And so I applied to the University of Washington, not imagining that, that I might not be accepted. Uh, and my grade point was good enough and whatever else the criteria were. Uh, so I was accepted immediately at the University of Washington. And that's, that's where I went from there. But what was the degree coming out of the University of Washington? I, I found the, the studies in psychology to be the best fit for what I was interested in, especially when I learned about the social science statistics and analysis and things like that. So uh, I did get my degree in psychology and uh, while I was at the University of Washington, I also worked in the, uh, as a counselor uh, at times, and I worked at Fairfax Psychiatric Hospital. And all of that was really good experience to teach me that those were not the things I wanted to do if I were going to pursue graduate work in psychology, that I would uh, instead be working with uh, quantitative aspects, as in testing, test analysis, that sort of stuff. And so what eventually did you go on to do? Eventually, some years later, the quantitative part of my studies prepared me for a career in information technology. At the time, there was no course called computer science at the University of Washington, uh, but on my own while working at non psychology work, uh, I purchased myself a computer and I taught myself computer programming, hardware, uh, when networking came along, I taught myself that. So I essentially taught myself a career uh, in information technology and I taught others. I actually taught classes, uh, which is a little bit strange for someone who has never taken a class. Uh, 
in information technology to be teaching, but uh, I enjoyed self-study, self-learning, and was good enough at it that that's just the way it came out. That's amazing. Well, Curtis, I think you have taught us a great deal about the need to be adaptable and how it can open other doors and basically help you discover another way of life. So I want to thank you very much for being with us. This is Curtis Thompson, and this has been Conversations About the Vietnam War. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Thank you.